I, I don't think, um, you know, we've ended up with a certain sort of cinema, if you believe cinema began in 1895, so we've had 120 years doing it. But really, I don't think anybody's ever seen any cinema yet. I think, you know, all our cinema is really illustrated novels, so we're really attached to the bookshop all the time. You know, the biggest thing probably in the last 15 years is Goddamn Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. I was about to say Lord of the Flies, but that's something else, isn't it? Um, so I, I think, you know, we have a desperately text-based industry. You know, cinema uh, is visited by people who want to be told a story, and since they go at 8 o'clock at night, that presumably is a bedtime story. It's the last thing they do before they go to sleep. So I think I've been always, um, should we say, deeply disenchanted by cinema because, let me repeat, it's just illustrated text. Um, I'm trained as a painter, so I'm going to be very biased about this. I think that cinema should really be about pictures, 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 pictures. So I've been trying all, I think, my career, and we've made over 80 films. We're now on our 16th feature film, to see if there are alternative ways in which we can truck cinema. Now, if you know anything about Drowning by Numbers, witness the title, I'm trying, I suppose, to minimize the text or to push down the narrativity and find other ways of stringing it together. Being trained as a painter, you know, I'm interested in things, really abstruse, exciting things to me, like color theory. Like, um, I, mean, I say color theory because perhaps the film I'm known most for is a movie called The Cook, Thief, His Wife and a Lover, which some people think is about cannibalism, but I think it's all about color. And here we have a device, which I think everybody all over the world now in the 21st century understands is a Western numerical system. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You know and I know that cinema is full of figures. 35 mil, 16 mil, Godard's famous dictum, cinema is the truth, 24 frames a second. So let's play a game. And that's particularly cogent because the whole film is about game playing. And the big game I play with you, the audience, is a number count. Start at one, finish at 100. It's also sort of useful that by the time you get to 50, you know you must be halfway through the movie. So it's going to create a certain distancing effect, you know, a typical sort of Brechtian alienation. I'm not here to give you escapist movies. I'm here to make a film. And I want to prove to you that the only thing you're watching is a film. It's just a film. It's not a slice of life. It's not a window on the world. It's a film. And films are deeply, deeply artificial, so I'm going to push hard on all that artificiality. 76 Lewis, 77 Forrest, 78 Kruppel, 79 Indy, 80 Smeltzer, 81 Krukis. But the major concern is a formalistic one about making a demonstration about film and time and non-narrativity. So indeed, we have a number count. It's a game. I'm playing a game with you. The numbers aren't always very easy to see, sometimes very easy to see on tree trunks, etc., etc. But sometimes the numbers are written on the back of a bee, for example. So you're going to have to keep your eyes open to catch that. Sometimes you don't even see the numbers. Sometimes they're in the soundtrack. Sometimes they're in a musical soundtrack. But they're all there. All right, Tolly Schreiker, 1931, scored 58 runs with one eye closed before falling down pavilion steps. I created for myself a huge amount of difficulties because if you're an editor, and that's what I'm trained as, you can play around and you can throw the script away and you can reconstruct. But if you've got a number count, I'm sorry, 42 always follows 41. So you've got to keep things in order. So that's a piece of sort of, um, shall we say, uh, creativity that keeps me in place too. But it's always reminding you all the time about the artificiality. All right, so that's, that's the structure. That's what I'm interested in. I could have made the first World War movie. I could have made a science fiction. I could have made Cinderella. But the essential game for me is this number structure. OK, I'm not going to push the boat out so far that I lose those very small audiences I have anyway. So I've got to give you something to get your teeth into. So I'm interested in number counts, and the number three is ubiquitous, is it not? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and the whole of Western culture. So the whole movie, apart from being one to hundred, is all about the figure three. Three main protagonists, three deaths, three murders, uh, three attempted escapes, etc., etc. So with all this material, I need to fashion a script which is going to be entertaining and instructive. 
Virgil, way back 100 AD, said an artwork has got to be in equal parts instructive and entertaining. I think the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo is an entertainment, but of a certain sort of order. But I also think it's an instruction. If you spend all your time instructing people, they're going to feel condescended to, and they're going to regard you as being avuncular, and they're going to get upset, and they'll probably get bored too. But if you only end up, you know, entertaining them, they're going to forget it, and it's only going to last a lifetime. So you could try and find a, a basis, I suppose, in equal parts to instruct and to entertain. Sheep are especially sensitive to the exact moment of the turn of the tide. In this game, nine tethered sheep react, pull on the stakes, jolt the chairs, and rattle the teacups. So I devised then um, a subject matter which essentially is death. I've always argued there are only two subject matters. One is sex and the other is death. What else is there to talk about? Because these are the non-negotiables, the very, very beginning and the very, very end. I think I know very little about you, but I do know two things. Two people fuck to make you, and I'm sorry you're going to die. So these are universal subject matters which we're all deeply, deeply fascinated in, whether we're serial killers or nuns, whether we want to be celibate or rape every single monkey in the world. The fascination of sex and death is always going to be with us. So you can see I've got all the parameters here, and now I have to sit down and put all the details in. I love writing dialogue. And uh, I think it's a comparatively easy f thing f for me to do. Therefore, I feel a bit dubious about it. I think it's too goddamn clever by half. So it's another reason why I suspect narrativity. I don't think narrativity actually exists in a way. Most of uh, cinema is about a frame, and you know the frame doesn't exist in nature. As you look at me now, and I certainly look at you, you're not in a frame. And you will never be in a frame, and there's no such thing as a frame in nature. And by the same token, I don't think there's such a thing as a narrative. These are comfort zone phenomena that we put together for our convenience. So I invent then a story about death, about three women who have deeply unsatisfactory husbands and have to get rid of them. I'm fascinated by the idea of drowning. Um, it could be a most amazing death, but it could also be a terrifying death. But it's also a way of organizing things that you can hoodwink the police. The notion of drowning uh, can be subscribed to so many accidental possibilities. And the basic structure of the movie is three women, all related, all strangely having the same name, who need to get rid of their husbands and not be accused of murder. So they dump down on a coroner. And a coroner's an extraordinary guy because he deals essentially with death. He has to subscribe, he has to explain, he has to find excuses. I don't think anybody dies from natural causes. That's an impossibility. When you die, they'll probably put something on your death certificate. It will probably be, I don't know, pneumonia? Uh, it won't be old age, because nobody dies of old age. That's just not medically possible. Again, it's also suggested, isn't it? Like Ivan Illich said, it's almost impossible to be healthy. A healthy person is just somebody who's been badly diagnosed. So all these things need to be fitted into this sort of ironic, bizarre situation, which I suppose we call life. Life on cinema, of course, is not life in the street at all. So I suppose with a smile on my face and a deep sense of irony, there needs to be a way that we can put together something which is also instructive about how we feel about death. We need to have some good actors to be able to put this all together. And I think we've got a really good, solid cast, uh, actors who essentially coming off the stage. I really like working with people who come off the stage because they can hold a performance together in a way which maybe is antithetical to that chop, 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 chop situation that we find very largely in contemporary cinema, deeply influenced by television, of course. May I see what I've always wanted to see? What is that? You, without any clothes on. What a strange desire. Now that's a strange game, Midget. Is it? So I already virtually, probably the back of my head, have an idea who those actors are. I'm familiar with their performances, so I can probably deliberately write dialogue for them. And uh, these three extraordinary ladies have all got, I think, a reputation of being associated very much with British theatre. So they come along dragging their cultural baggage with them, so we understand. I mean, the heritage is all... Um, 
uh, 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 the sort of acting families, for example, that Jolly Richardson is associated with. They go way back, way back. And I think that sort of artificiality is built into their dialogue and essentially built into their performance. I like his hands. I might let him touch me and then I tell you all about it. Well, you are the last in the line. What if he were to be disappointed? That might spoil it. You better not go too far, then. If one of us were to make it with him, surely it would exclude the other two. I doubt if Magic could get it up three times in an afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> And then, since I'm trained as a painter, I want to make extremely beautiful pictures. If a picture's ugly, I'll throw it away, whatever else is valuable. And I think, you know, beauty, although it embarrasses a lot of English people, like all words ending in Y in English, always embarrass people because they sound as though they come out of the nursery. But I'm going to make sure, if you don't agree with my subject matter, if you're bored by my philosophizing, you're going to be wowed by the pictures. So. We have here a whole series of uh, possibilities and probabilities that can be shaped together to make 120 minutes of familiar material, I think, because there's a lot of Englishness, uh, maybe eccentric interest. Um, I live in Holland now, and the Dutch hate eccentricity, but I know the English really, really love eccentrics. Cinema should be an art form, and therefore it should aim, I think, for all the things we expect of a sophisticated adult art form. Think of the 19th century novel, think of the 18th century symphony, think of uh, history painting all the way since the Renaissance. These items take a long time to make, extremely well wrought, and would hope, I think, to think that they're aimed at an audience that is sophisticated, that's smart, that's wise, that has a, a great understanding maybe of the I suppose the intricacies and the stupidities and the bar nature of uh, you know human life. So let's do what we can to put as much information in and as many different levels to totally, totally engage them. So I would like to think that I make really well wrought films which are capable of continuously being deciphered. I am. Um, Come, I suppose, from a certain part of uh, England, which is very flat. I now live in Holland, which is even flatter. And the area that really fascinates me is the southeast coast. So that's Suffolk, Norfolk, Kent. And I was always very keen to go back. It's the landscape of my childhood, essentially. You know, I remember sunsets over the sea and walking into the North Sea and freezing cold in the middle of winter and all those sorts of things. So the downside and the upside. Now, I don't know whether you know that boundary area between Norfolk and Suffolk, but it's comparatively unspoiled even now. So point number one is if I want to make a structural movie to show and demonstrate the artificiality of cinema, point two is I need to put it in a place I know well. It was very, very cold. We were supposed to be making this movie in the end. It was supposed to be an end of summer movie. But what with the difficulties and the fragility of film finance, we found ourselves in October when we should have been in August. One of the most extraordinary things is all the leaves were falling off the trees. And half the trees you see in this film, we've got a whole host of uh, art students from Rotterdam who came over and stuck the leaves back on the trees. I would advise everybody to wear very warm underwear. And still, some of those scenes of people splashing about in the cold sea are remembered very, very vividly. Uh, it was incredibly damn cold. Michael came out of, um, of um, uh, music school, I think, uh, in Kensington, about the same time as I came out of art school in Kensington. And we almost met, I think, by accident. We had a mutual friend. And um, we were fascinated by comparatively obscure films like, I suppose, Eisenstein's Alexander Nevsky, where Prokofiev did the music. And they had a system whereby it was considered that Prokofiev should not write a single note of music, and Eisenstein would not frame a single frame until they'd worked out a scheme. I think music's used very, very badly in the cinema. It's normally an adjunct. 
you know, give me two and a half minutes of chase. Give me, you know, three and a half minutes of pathos. And the most stupid one of all, give me 30 seconds of silence. Really counterproductive. But it's the way, isn't it, that cinema is basically made. And most of the pictures are in place before either a producer or a director phones up, I won't say a composer, but a man who makes, or a woman who makes, music for cinema, which is not the same thing. And I think there are really comparatively very few really good composers, really good composers working in cinema. Um, Stockhausen, I don't think. Full Glass, yes. Um, but should we say those grand, you know, European composers like um, Shostakovich or um, Berg or Weber, probably through certain reasons of snobbism, didn't really work with the cinema. They found it to be a banal medium, which I think is very, very sad. But there were some extraordinary people, and I mentioned already Prokofiev, who found it a bright new medium and something to be entertained by. But I think the way in which I've described how music is used in the cinema, which is really sort of secondary, if not tertiary, is not ideal for the ego of a composer. But there were experiments that both Michael Nyman and myself were intrigued by, and these later experiments by Eisenstein were part of that game. So we again, as theoreticians maybe of cinema, would argue that we ought to try and do something about that, so music should be structural and not merely decorative. The player can determine the dreams of the next night if he awakes before the castle collapses. Those players who wish to dream of romance build their castles with the seven of hearts. You know, you can make, and a lot of very good French filmmakers have certainly made movies without music, and it's to totally, totally possible. But I always think that, you know, the relationship of the cinematic image and music was a marriage that should be made in heaven. I always feel that films without music are somehow impoverished. And certainly these beginnings with Michael Nyman were very important. This was the time of New York music in the 1960s, a name like Phil Glass, for example, rise very high in that. And as you probably know, or can imagine, minimal music is excellent to cut to. It's virtually the same thing. It's highly, highly rhythmic. And there's a way it's structured beautifully mathematically so you can edit on frame counts. We spent a lot of time, you know, playing with those sorts of games. Um, there was a way, I think, that maybe um, we, it, the game playing we played became too repetitive, too reproducible. There was a second generation of minimalist um, people coming up. As now, I think, minimalism is still the last biggest thing in Western classical music. There still hasn't been anything as big as that since. And I think everybody's looking for that great explosion in terms of music. Maybe it'll never happen again because music has become so di di so 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 variegated, you know? And and probably the most easily to be traveled. You know, Sting can make a piece of music on a Friday night and it's in Beijing on Saturday morning. Apart from the internet, nothing moves faster. So there is a way that music, and I'm always very envious and I certainly can't write music, can be extremely intellectual. Think of Bach but also can be extremely emotional. Noel Carl had said, talked about the power of cheap music and it affects us all. So the ability to make people think and manipulate their emotions surely is really to do with the prime media, I suppose, of interchange and communication, which is music. So I really, really am excited indeed about putting music to image. And I think the last movie we made together, Michael Nyman and myself, would have been Prospero's books, the movie we made with uh, John Gilgood playing Prospero. I'm now working with a lot of Italian sort of sixth generation minimalists that lots of other influences have come and been part of their music process. But it is an enthusiasm that I still live with. Sasha Vini has got Russian parents witness indeed that Christian name. Uh, but I think he was educated and brought up in Paris, which must be the very center, the epicenter of a notion of cinema being art. I think he was actually an assistant's assistant way back 
in probably 36, 37, uh, because he worked on Cocteau's Testament d'Orfay, which is a hell of a long time ago. Um, he walked, worked all the way through um, the Second World War on very politicized films. So he was, um, I mean, he would hate me, he's dead now, but he would hate me even talking about this, but he was a prime member of the French Resistance, and he's a communist, extremely left-wing. He's very, very good if you want to get paid on one of his films, because he'll fight for you to the absolute nth. And then he got involved, of course, in the Nouvelle Vague, in a very powerful mid-20th century cinema movement, from which any for everybody benefits from. So, you know, he worked with my great cinematic hero is Alain René, but he worked with Godard, and he worked with Chris Marco, and he worked with Chabrol. And then towards the end of the Nouvelle Vague, when everybody was getting tired of it, he started working with people like uh, Margarita Duras and all those um, uh, intellectuals like Robe Grier and the Nouvelle Romain. So his, his knowledge of cinema and literature and painting was always very, very profound. But he was an extremely wise old bird too and would never suffer fools gladly. I think he was probably in his early 60s when he sort of came out of semi-retirement. He'd just been working with Bunnell, uh, Bunuel. So he'd made The Sweet Charm of the Bourgeoisie, for example, and a couple of other uh, really important sort of Spanish, what, mid-20th century movies. So you can see his background was very, very strong. And he had a whole pocket full of tricks, amazing amount of tricks. He's brought up essentially with black and white cinema, thinks very much in black and white, often thinks that making films in color is trivializing, but that was probably uh, maybe a prejudice of those times. You remember when there was first color television? I think the first tele color television I ever saw was Wimbledon, and everybody forgot the tennis and just said, wow, look at that grass, isn't it green? Uh, look at that orange juice that tennis heroes drinking, isn't it orange? And there was a feeling, wasn't there, an extraordinary piece of cinema snobbism for a time, that if you'd make films somehow in color, you weren't being serious. Isn't that absurd? Isn't that absolutely absurd? But again, it's an indication of how we play games with convention. The convention becomes more important than the notions of reality. Well, he was aware of all these ironies, and I suppose I was too. And I was very excited indeed to be associated with a man that had such an extraordinary knowledge. But to use that knowledge in a curious way very lightly, and wasn't going to ram it down our throats, but the tricks he had. I mean, he always carried a compass on him. The compass was the bone. I don't know, one, you could stand his compass on the end of your little finger. But he was always taking it out and surreptitiously and checking where the sun was. And that was an indication to me, you know, be aware of the light. And be aware if you're a cinematographer, you cannot fight God. God will always do it better than you can. But in Drowning by Numbers, we did do some crazy things. Brilliant sort of um, English, um, Southeast England sunlight, which sometimes, even in October, was pretty strong. We would put artificial lights in a field. It's rather subtle, but there are ways and means indeed you can challenge God a little. Can't really win very well. But you can do things with trees, you know, by night, which is really rather exciting. He would, um, if we ever had a sequence of steps, he'd take a piece of chalk out of his pocket and he would line every step to make sure you could see the edges. This, again, doesn't sound amazingly profound, but there was a way his understanding of how to help an audience see was really profound. We made a film uh, before this called Z and Two Noughts, which incidentally is probably a very bad film, but it's my favorite film. You know, if you have a bunch of children, and I have four, and one of them's myopic or slightly crippled or not so bright on the uptake, that's the one you lavish your love on. And I always feel if anybody ever gave me money to make one of my own films again, it would be Z and Two Noughts. I say that because we actually made a list, I'm a great list maker, of 26 ways, 26 letters in the alphabet, 26 ways to light a scene. By dawn, by sunlight, by firelight, by candlelight, by cathode tube light, um, by starlight, by moonlight. I can't remember the whole list, but there was 26. And it became a point of honor to light or use all those 26 ways in which to light a film. It's game playing again, but again, it draws attention to the artificiality of cinema. 
Okay, I've given you a sort of portrait of this guy. He was always, always, I suppose, um, aware indeed of the artificiality and the fact that I was only about in my mid-30s and he was at the end of his 60s. So he tended to be, shall we say, avuncular, but in a very, very pleasing way. And along with me, he, um, I suppose, uh, entertained and also taught a brilliant young um, Dutch uh, DOP, Director of Photography, a man called Rainier van Brommelen. And when finally Sasha died, I think he died about 10 years ago, there's this young, brilliant filmmaker who took over. And he took over everything that Sasha could have taught him in 30 years, but also began to add the digital revolution to his vocabulary. I have a feeling that Sasha would not have been too happy with the digital revolution because at the heyday of the 60s and the 70s, the cameraman was king. The cameraman is not king anymore. I can do anything I like with a cameraman's product. I can, you know, reframe it, re-aspect ratio it, change its color, regrade it. I can make it look like Helmut Newton or Cartier-Bresson. I can just change everything. So the most important person now in the cinema is the editor because we have extraordinary tools now to really recreate anything that the cameraman does. And I don't think such a Verney would be very happy about that. But he would have probably, you know, just simply smiled and, you know, moved on. He has some peculiar quirks, too. Um, he believed an apple a day keeps the doctor away. He insisted at 12 o'clock on eating an apple. And he used to get the producer, a rather proud man, to go to the local vegetable shop and buy him an apple. Okay, eccentricities, but extraordinary profound man. Very sad his passing, but we made, I think, I think we made eight feature films together and they were delightful to make. There are many, many compositions from classical post-Renaissance painting. There's a dead body taken out of the sea and he's posed like Christ in a very famous painting of dead Christ. There's another famous painting of, by Holbein of a dead Christ, bringing in again the Trinity imagery. So we're constantly reproducing, for those in the know, the compositions of a lot of really important painting. Um, I mean, that's the sort of, again, sort of game-playing thing, but it's also a sort of heritage thing. You know, every time you and I open our mouths, we're probably quoting Shakespeare, even without realizing it. And every time an advertising agency puts an image together, they're probably quoting a painting image, though again, they might be very, very surprised to find that they're doing that. You know, there's that beautiful phrase by John Donne, no man is an island, no film is an island. Films are constantly, constantly, consciously or unconsciously quoting and repeating the huge heritage we've got, both in terms of literature and certainly in terms of painting. I want to play those games and I want to show, since I'm trained as a painter, that I want to belong to that club. It's a huge club. You know, Picasso is always reworking Velasquez. Henry Moore reworks Michelangelo. Salvador Dali reworks Da Vinci. It's part of the game. It's like belonging to the club of painters that have been around for 3,000 years. So that, I think, is part and parcel of maybe of my cinema practice. But for those who are awake indeed, uh, Smart, the little boy who plays games with death again, uh, in his room, indeed, there are 100 objects, all beginning with the letter C. You'd have to freeze the frame, but I can assure you they're there. It's, in a curious way, uh, part of that language. The film is made many, many years ago and is almost pre-digital. But, you know, when we see digital films now, we can freeze frames and we can retread them and we can send them backwards and so on and so on. So there are games being played, I suppose, in this analog movie which prefigure what we can now do with these sorts of uh, situations. There is a way, I think, um, you know, these things become, as again, that suggestion as we all move towards the criticism of ourselves. So you know, if you occasionally wear a red hat and people say, hey, look, he's wearing a red hat. I bet you on every Sunday you'll start wearing a red hat. There's a way we move towards the opinion that other people have of ourselves. And in the beginning, I think a lot of these things were only half conscious and now they're very, very, very conscious. Like, for example, I used to like meal scenes in films. I wasn't really aware I was putting them in, but now I cannot make a film without a meal scene. It's almost become part of the game. 
Have some heart. How's cake? Uh, no, thank you. Did we ever argue? Yes, we did. We argued all the time. And it came that I was beginning to create a vocabulary for myself, which was in some ways, like time-out critics would always say, it has to be a green away thing because it's like that, it's like that, like that. And the cinematographer used to come to me some days when we were trying to do something different. He said, you can't do that. Greenaway doesn't do that. After uh, the enthusiasms, when the film is at the top of your head and you're thinking about it all the time, after they've died down, which is probably about six weeks after the premiere, there's a way you become, I suppose, retrospectively rather disenchanted. I should have done that. We should have left that out. The film's too long. That's a poor piece of casting. So you become very, very critical. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy making films, but I'm not a very good spectator. I'm always looking for actors. I'm always looking for, you know, new cinematic intelligences with what Microsoft invented yesterday morning. Of course, I have to be up with all that. But the actual activity of sitting down and watching, watching a film is for me not a particularly exciting experience. I think, you know, in the 1910s and 1920s, there was huge hope that cinema would be really, really amazing. And I don't think it has been. Going back to the beginning of our conversation, you know, I think basically it's a form of illustrated text and that's not good enough. It doesn't do text good and it certainly doesn't do cinema good. It's really a painter's medium, and there are very, very few painters who are actually using it as a medium. And I think there has become related, I suppose, to Bollywood-Hollywood phenomenon that most people have a general superficiality about notions of the cinema, that it's predominantly a form of escapist, illusionist phenomenon, and not really right in the center of our body of cultural perception. But maybe I'm being very churlish. It's only been going for 120 years. My favorite uh, phenomenon is painting, which has been going for 8,000. So maybe I should simply shut up and wait. I am heartened by the fact that we now have this extraordinary brand new digital revolution, which potentially is allowing us all to become Picassos. But maybe we're going to have to wait around and wait for those Picassos to come out of the woodwork. I think as part of this, I've just made a film about Eisenstein. Eisenstein, I think, is the only truly, really amazing cinema maker. And he's dead by 1948. But I think his heritage goes on and on. But I don't know, I think really brilliant cinematic intelligence is very, very rare. If you think what's been going on in world culture from 1895, when cinema was supposed to have been invented, to 2015, where we are now, 120 years. It hasn't had the huge bounds of excitement that painting has. You know, we're thinking Van Gogh to Andy Warhol, huge changes of excitements. It hasn't had the huge excitements of music. We're thinking of Strauss to Stockhausen. It hasn't had the excitements of literature. You know, we're thinking H.G. Wells to Perec and Borges. These are huge changes which is following exactly the same 120 years. But, you know, Scorsese, who probably still is the most respected American film director, still makes the same films as Griffiths. The same vocabulary, the same beginning, middle and end, the same text-based phenomenology. There hasn't been those huge excitements of form and language and grammar and syntax and vocabulary that have been part and parcel of all the other exciting media that surely does indicate some measure of failure. But cinema, I'm afraid, you know, it's not Californian. It really is of much more greater significance than that. If we believe cinema to be really serious, we've got to be really serious about it. How many did you count? A hundred. There are more than a hundred. I know. Why did you stop? A hundred is enough. Once you've counted a hundred, all the other hundreds are the same.